Good morning, Murray Hill. Thank you for joining us this Resurrection Sunday. Let's stand and let's worship our Savior together. I was buried beneath my strength. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn. Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tool Till I met you You called me
we come this morning celebrating the resurrected King, celebrating King Jesus who sits at your right hand and who defeated death. God, we thank you for that sacrifice and for his sacrifice. 
providing us the opportunity for today, for this celebration, and for our ability to be connected with you, our Savior and our King. It's in his name we pray this morning. Amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Happy Easter. Thanks so much for being here. Excited that you are with us. If you're here in the building, if you're joining us online, excited to have you as well. Um, so I want to let you know about a couple things right here uh, in the building. In front of you, there is a connection card uh, that we'll take just a minute here and get filled out. If you're joining us online, um, you can access it through our website, murrayhill.church. The connection card does two different things for us. On the front, uh, it gets some basic information about you and if you have any questions for us. Uh, ways that we can get connected to you, whether you prefer that through email, uh, text message, phone call, anything like that. Uh, we'd love to be able to answer any of your questions that you have about us. And then on the back side, there's an area for your prayer requests. So things going on uh, in your life that we could pray for. Um, we've got a prayer team that meets every week that would love to have the opportunity uh, to pray for you about anything going on in your life. Again, through that connection card, if you want to have a, have a conversation with someone, um, we would love to facilitate that for you. And so that's what the uh, connection card does on the front and back. And you can drop it uh, in the baskets on your way in or out. Uh, the baskets are also how we participate in worship. So um, if you're uh, old school, you got check, that kind of stuff. Uh, you can send that in. You can put it in the baskets. Also, we try to make giving uh, easy for you and facilitate that uh, either through online giving or text to give or anything like that. So uh, you see that information up behind me, and you can find that again um, on our website. So uh, two things. Uh, if you guys were not at the egg hunt yesterday, you missed the quickest 6.2 seconds of egg hunting ever. <laughs> Uh, it was amazing, uh, thanks to our volunteers that did the uh, pre-work for hiding of the eggs where we removed the things we didn't want the kids to find. Um, and then uh, those who also assisted us with, quote-unquote, hiding the eggs uh, and or dropping them in large amounts all over the grass. Um, but it was a lot of fun uh, at Four Corners, thanks to our volunteers, thanks to Kim, uh, putting it all together. Uh, they had craft time. Now that they've got the playground over there in that one quadrant, that uh, adds another piece to it. Had a good opportunity uh, to show the community how much we love them, to show the community uh, that we're excited to be a part of Murray Hill and excited uh, to have them join us with our uh, different events and things like that going on. So uh, that was loads of fun. Thanks so much if you were there. Uh, if you were not there, you need to put it on your calendar next year because it's pretty amazing, and we had like the perfect weather of all time yesterday, so uh, it, it was great. Um, only one announcement for you guys. Uh, if you are new um, to our body, if you are um, thinking about maybe becoming a member, seeing what that means, um, next week we have a new members class that will follow the Sunday morning worship service. So if you will email info at murrayhill.church just to let us know that you're coming um, so that we can be prepared and have everything uh, for you and available. Um, if you show up, it doesn't lock you in. We don't, you know, lock it from the inside and that you're stuck there for the entire time. Um, but would definitely like to get you some more information um, about who we are and what we do uh, and excited to have you join us if that's a, a decision that you make. So um, if you know me, um, you know uh, that sometimes my brain functions in odd ways, uh, and I often uh, spend the bulk of my time interacting with middle school students. Um, and so one thing that I have wondered, um, and Pastor Doug talked last week um, about the death and, and a different way about looking at it and, and going about it. So one thing I have often wondered on Easter Sunday morning is how did Jesus exit the grave. And, and I, I think that, I, I've heard pastors talk about before, um, you know, in the story of creation, says that, that humans were made in the image of God. And, and sometimes we struggle as humans that we want to put God in our image and, and we want certain aspects of God that we like and certain parts of Jesus that we like. And, and so like when you, when you think about Jesus, if, if the first story is Jesus turning the tables over and, and making the whip and running the people out of the temple, like you probably envision Jesus coming out of the grave like WWE, like poof, like I'm knocking it over, I'm rolling the stone away, here I am. 
And, and if, if you think about Jesus and, and you think about the healer and you think about the one who knew he was just about to raise Lazarus from the dead, but still wept with his sisters and still decided that though he could call legions of angels down, he was going to suffer for each one of us. And so the great thing is today it really doesn't matter because what matters is that the stones rolled away, that Jesus is alive, and that today we get to celebrate that. And so as we sing this morning, not that you're, you're not already thinking about that, but, but we're about to sing a song that talks about holiness. And, and to be holy is, is to be set apart. And the Savior that we worship this morning is ultimately so set apart and yet made that sacrifice so that we can be connected to God and we can have that relationship with Him. Let's stand and continue singing together.
God, thank you. Thank you that, that your holiness does not preclude our participation. That your holiness does not prevent us from being a part of your family, God. That it's through the sacrifice, through your sending of Jesus, God, that we can be a part of your family. That we can celebrate this morning with each other, with brothers and sisters in Christ, being a part of everything that you've done.
Heavenly Father, we come before you and acknowledge the reality there's nothing in this world that compares to you. Thank you so much for the empty tomb. Thank you for a Savior who was willing to give everything for us. Thank you that we mattered that much to you. And Father, I pray that this morning that we would have an encounter with you that is very real and powerful. I pray that today would be transformational for all of us. And I pray that your spirit would guide us as we interact with the scripture today. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for the one who's been given the name that is above all names. And that is the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So I'm going to tell you a couple of things uh, before we do the sermon. Uh, first of all, next week you don't want to miss. All right? I know every pastor says that on Easter, but, but here's the deal. Uh, we're doing Operation Neighbor next week. We're starting Operation Neighbor, if you're not familiar. It is an opportunity for us as a church to go outside the walls and do ministry uh, in ways that we don't ever do. And so uh, we're going to start that next week. And so you will have the opportunity, if you choose to, to be a part of a team that does ministry outside these walls. And so that's all I'm going to tell you. The rest you have to come and find out. Okay? If you don't know. And so I'd love to have you here. Also, I want to uh, piggyback on what Jay said. Thank you for everybody who volunteered yesterday. Um, and not just yesterday, those who brought eggs, those who stuffed eggs, uh, those who did all the work. And uh, Kim, it was awesome. Uh, thank you for, for everybody working so hard to pull that off. Um, it, was, it was a great event. And um, so I did a little sociological sp- experiment there um, yesterday. And so um, I started with the youngest group. And I would go to them and I would say, are you going to get a lot of eggs today? And of course, every, every time, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the youngest group, I said, so are you going to share your eggs with me? And the youngest one said, yes, yes. And I said, well, that's very sweet of you. You don't have to share your eggs with me. Okay. So I'd go to the next older group and I would say the same thing. Are you going to get a lot of eggs today? Yeah, I'm going to get a lot of eggs. You want to share them with me? And it was like, I will, but I don't really want to. Yes. I said, oh, it's okay. You don't have to. I'm just, I'm just having fun. Then I went to the older group, and I said, you're going to get a lot of eggs today? Absolutely, I'm going to get a lot of eggs today. You're going to share them with me? Are you crazy? <laughs> that's just kind of, kind of how it went. And then I thought, well, don't you love Jesus? Give the pastor can. No, I'm kidding. I didn't say that. <laughs> so anyway, it was a great time, and, and uh, enjoyed being around the, the kids and seeing all that, that happened and, and uh, meeting a lot of new, new people and, and interacting with new folks. So today I thought we'd talk about the resurrection. Um, it is Easter, after all. And uh, we, we've been building up to this for weeks, and uh, we've been going through John's version of the story and, and talking about that. And, and so, kind of like last week, I'm probably going to go a little different direction than you might think that I be, I'm going to go. Um, but understand, and as we go through this, uh, we'll talk about it a little more, but this is John's version of the story of Jesus, okay? Probably written decades after the events. Probably he's dictating to someone, someone else, this is what took place. And that becomes pretty pertinent here in just a few minutes. So we're in John chapter 20. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. If you're in the room using the Pew Bible, it's on page 1087. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. So early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Okay, so we're just going to go through this passage and... um, Early on the first day of the week, 
While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Mary went to the tomb, found it empty. She looked in, assumed she had some light source to see that the body wasn't there, and she made this incredible assumption the body had been stolen. Okay, now why would she do that? She had assumed that because robbing graves was a common practice, and so it was assumed that the body had been taken away, um, and, and so she was, just didn't know what to do. And so she responded with, by running and telling Peter and the disciple who Jesus loved, who was John, writing about himself, he said, so he went to them and told them the tomb, they took his body. The, the assumption was they made the conclusion, she made the conclusion the body had been stolen. And I, I'm not getting on to Mary Magdalene, because I think in a lot of ways we're just like her. But sometimes we forget that God can. There was no presumption in her mind that Jesus had come back to life. There was no thought in her head that something miraculous had taken place. The thought was somebody stole the body. And the reason that was the case is because it didn't make any logical sense to her. It made no sense at all. How, how could he be alive and, and there be a resurrection? That never even crossed her mind. Even though he talked about it, even though she'd seen all the miracles and she'd seen all the great things happen, it, it never crossed her mind that God had the capability of bringing Jesus back to life. And I want to tell you, as we go through this journey in life, many times we live with the idea of forgetting that God can. That God can do what we cannot imagine he could do. That God can do greater things than we can ever dream up. That God has the capacity and the ability to do that which is beyond any of our expectations. Because what we do with God is, is like Mary did in this, in this scene, is we, we look at God and we say, okay, here's the parameters and things that God can do. Because these are the things that make sense to me. And so we assume that God can't. But, but here I, I want to tell you, and the whole resurrection story is, is about this reality that, that God, he can. He can. And I think sometimes we don't ask God to because we don't really believe down deep that he can. But, but he can. There are things that only God can pull off. Things that are miraculous, things that are amazing, things that, that he does that there's no human way possible that could happen any other way unless he did it. We just don't function in that reality because we want it all to make sense. As we have this picture of God, we, we decide who he is, we decide what, what he's capable of and what he's willing to do beforehand, and we many times don't even ask. But I want to tell you, it's been amazing on this journey of being a pastor of watching what God can do that he should have never done. They didn't have the capacity to do in people's minds. How many times have I stood with someone and, and prayed with them? There, there was a man who, who talked to me after church, it's been some time ago, and he came to me in desperation, and he said, Pastor Doug, I, I need a job. It was a time when jobs were scarce. And he said, I'm, I'm getting to a point where it's really bad to, I really need a job, and I don't know what to do. And I said, well, I don't know of any openings, but I tell you what, let's pray. Let's ask God to do something amazing. So we prayed, and, and, and Tuesday he called me and said, it, it worked, it worked, it worked. I said, what, what worked, what worked, what worked? He said, I got a job. There's this company I applied for, but they hired somebody else, but that guy decided to take a different job, and so they called me on Tuesday. I was like, Wow. I can tell you stories about there was a, a lady who was pregnant and she went to the doctor and the doctor said, Your baby's not going to make it. There's nothing we can do. So she came and she asked the elders to pray over her. That little kid runs around this building in the day. And we can tell you a story about a lady who looked me in the eyes through tears and said, Is there any hope for my marriage? I said, I don't know, but I believe God can do a great work. Let's pray about it. And over time, after a, a lot of different things happen, their marriage is thriving today. And so don't hear me say what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that every time you ask, God's going to say yes, because that's not true. 
But hear me say that God can. He has the capacity to. So I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if you need a job. I don't know if you need healing. I, I, don't be afraid to ask because he can. He can. And just like Mary, we, Mary came to the tomb and there was no thought of Jesus being alive. Many times we come to God and think there's absolutely nothing that can be done, but God can. So ask. I encourage you to ask. It'll blow your mind what God can do and what he does. All right, the second thing, and, and this is of all the parts of all the different stories of the resurrection, these are my favorite verses in the resurrection because I realize that John's a lot like me, okay? John, as he goes through here, he does something that I would have done. Remember, he's an old guy looking back, and he's telling this story, and somebody's writing it down for him. And I want to point out that three times he makes it clear that he beat Peter to the tomb. All right? If, if he would have told us once, we'd say, okay, he's telling the story. But three times he goes out of his way to make it absolutely clear that he beat Peter to the tomb. Okay? Watch this. Verse 3. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, being John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Okay, you're, you're giving us a picture of the story. Two guys running, he gets there first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him. Now that word in the Greek is fantastic because it says the one who was way behind him. <laughs> All right? And so I'm, I'm having this picture of Peter and John having this relationship that as long as Peter was alive, John would come up and say, hey, you want to race? You want to race? I'll run backwards. We'll make it close. All right, so he goes on. Um, so the, then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, <laughs> also went inside. Now, I don't know a whole lot about Greek, but I know that repetition... Is for emphasis. And so I can see John as this old man just saying, I got to tell you guys a story. I killed him. It wasn't even close. It wasn't even close. He was slow and fat. He didn't have a chance, <laughs> right? So I, I tell you that because when you read the gospel stories, that's the personality of the disciples, right? You've heard me call them knuckleheads over and over again, all right? That's their personality, because over and over again, even the night that Jesus washed their feet and told them to be servants, you know what they argued about when he was done? Which one's the greatest? And so they, this is their personality. This is, they're in competition with each other. All right, hear me clearly, all right? I'm particularly probably the gentleman. The faith journey is not a competition. It is not a competition. And I get it. I want to win. Whatever I'm playing, I want to win. The only thing I like losing is playing um, hi-ho cheerio with my granddaughter because she gets so excited when she wins. She's a little older. I won't get excited when she wins, right? Because we like to win. And so what happens to us is we start down this faith journey and we think, okay, I'm doing okay as long as I'm doing better than that person. Or at least I'm not like that person. I read an article this week. Most bizarre story, one of the most bizarre stories I've ever heard. There was a man who was pretending to be a pastor. And he would go and he would start churches. And he'd get people coming to this church. And he would find the wealthiest widow in the group and he would marry them. And then the marriage wouldn't work out, they would divorce, and he'd get half the money. He did this 10 times. 10 times before he was caught and got arrested. And I go, you know what? I'm not that bad. <laughs> I got stuff wrong with me, but I'm better than that guy. Right? And so we, 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 we live this life thinking there's got to be somebody worse than me. There's got to be somebody that, yeah, I don't do that. But what happens is, is we forget the reality is that this is my journey. 
in my relationship with Jesus. It's not a competition. I'm not trying to outdo you. You shouldn't be trying to outdo me. We're pursuing Christ. And see, and I think what we forget is this reality. There's 8 billion people on the planet, right? 8 billion. And there's nobody on the planet that has your story, your personality, your strengths and weaknesses, your talents and gifts. Out of 8 billion people, you're the only one that's just like you. Only one. What are the odds? One in eight billion, right? There's only one. And God created you with the purpose of connecting to Him in your relationship with Him. You see, what happens when we live this life of comparison, when we try to evaluate how we're doing as compared to other people, we not only realize we find somebody worse than us, but we begin to we become very judgmental. How could you do that? How could you be that way? How could you be like that person? How could you do that thing to someone else? And so we all of a sudden become judgmental, and we forget the reality that Jesus called us to deal with the log in our own eye instead of the splinters in everyone else's. So it's not a competition. Oh, and I, I get it, competition can make it more fun and we can make us feel better about ourselves, but, but the reality is it is not, nor has it ever been a competition. This is about me and Jesus and you and Jesus and your journey with him. Because you're the one in eight billion and what he wants is for you to reach your potential in him. And your potential is different than everybody else's. And that's Okay. Right? Now, I want to get to the last sentence and, and, uh, that we're going to look at. So, after John stepped into the tomb, he has this one sentence about himself. He said, he saw and believed. And I look at that, and I'm, okay, what did he believe? I think there's multiple things going on. First of all, he realized the body wasn't stolen because the linens were there. You wouldn't steal a body and leave the linens. Uh, that would take too long. And also, you see the strips of linen there, and, and really, if they had been taken off of a body in a normal way, they'd have been in shatters all over the place and, and just all ripped up. And, and so he looked at the scene, and he looked at what happened, and he came to the conclusion something supernatural took place. Somehow, in that, in that moment, as his brain was processing the whole story, instead of the despair that he'd been feeling for the last 48 hours, he now looked and he saw something supernatural happened here. Parenthetically, in the following sentence, we still didn't fully get it, but he knew something supernatural had taken place, and he believed and I'm sure he began to process all those times that Jesus said, the Son of Man must go into Jerusalem and the religious leaders must kill him and bury him, but he'll come back to life on the third day. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, he told us about this. I still don't fully get it, but, but he mentioned that this might happen. And it was at that moment that he looked at the empty tomb, in the empty tomb, and he said to himself, something supernatural took place. We come to Easter on to come to, to church on, on Easter Sunday, and I make a bold assumption that if you're here, there's at least a part of you that believes there's an empty tomb and something supernatural took place. Now, maybe not. Maybe you're here out of obligation to family members or whatever it might be. That's okay. Maybe you're here and you're just trying to see if any of this makes sense. I, I get it. But for general, most of us would say that we accept the reality that something supernatural took place there in the tomb, just like John. And so the question is, all right, if that's what went place, if that's what John believed, is that God had done something beyond his capacity to understand. And it's really true. How does it affect me? Well, some would hear the story and they would say, okay, you know, I'm here on Easter, uh, I believe in the resurrection, so you know what? I need to start living a better life. 
I, I need to start doing better things. I need to start treating people better. Well, let, let me tell you, that'll work for a while. It's kind of like me and ice cream. You know, I can eat just a little bit for a while, but eventually I got to eat the whole thing. Because our will can't win. And so it's, it's not about trying to get ourselves right. As we, I say around here all the time, quit trying to be good and be in love with Jesus instead. We, we can't make ourselves better, but just for a time. Well, maybe, maybe we realize and accept the supernatural reality of an empty tomb, and we say, you know what, I just need to come to church more. Let me say, as a pastor, we'd love for you to come to church more. We'd love for you to be here. But that's not why we do what we do. When there are more of you here, we feel better, and you feel better, and all of that. And, and, and we, are, we discover, as the world gets more and more crazy, how much we need each other. But that's not the goal. That's not what this is all about. And then, maybe if we're honest and we step back and say, okay, there's an empty tomb. And I believe something supernatural happened. I believe that Jesus came back to life. If I really believe that, if I truly, down to the core of my being, accept that to be truth, then I had to build my life around Jesus. Because if he was crucified and buried and came back to life, that's the apex of history. That's what the story is all about. It's about God loving us so much that he gave the very best he could give for us. And Jesus is alive. And so, if he's alive and it's really true, then I ought to build my life around him and who he is. And I say it this way, you're not a salesperson who happens to be a believer in Jesus. You're a follower of Jesus who happens to be a salesperson. You're not a teacher that happens to believe in Jesus. You are a follower of Jesus who happens to be a teacher. And we can go on from I'm not a pastor who happens to be a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus who happens to be a pastor. And we go through every career, and we can look at it this, that way and understand that how the whole dynamic changes, how every conversation, how everything that I do, it, it begins to matter in a different way because I'm representing King Jesus on earth. And I know if that's new information for you, that, that man, that sounds incredibly radical and crazy. And let me tell you, sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. But let me make it clear that nothing else in the world, no other journey, no other pursuit will bring you the peace and contentment that pursuing King Jesus will bring you. You're one in eight billion. You're one with a unique story. You're one created in the image of God. You're one that's been set aside to be who you are, where you are, doing what you do right now at this point in history. God has created you for a purpose. And the purpose is to live for him. You're not going to get it right all the time. None of us do. But we keep coming back to this reality. Why do I walk on this earth? I am here for King Jesus. If there really is an empty tomb, every day I ought to be committed to him and what he wants to accomplish. So if you're new to this, I challenge you, prayerfully consider and ask, who do you want me to be? It'll be transformational for you. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and so grateful for the empty tomb. So, great, so grateful that we're not in a competition, but thankful that there is an empty tomb that gives us purpose and direction in life. And Father, I pray this morning that there's anyone here that is struggling with faith questions, struggling with 
difficulties in their lives that they would find this day as the day that they run to you. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here, anyone watching that has not accepted the grace of the forgiven Savior, the grace and forgiveness of the Savior, I pray that today would be a day that they come to you. So, Father, bless this time. Use it for your honor and glory and make it everything you want it to be. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So hear me clearly. The Easter story is your story. The crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection. It was about us. It was about Jesus doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. See, we go through this life journey trying to do good stuff, and, and, and that's great, and but we can't do enough good to be right with God. So Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. The cross, the burial, the resurrection, it's all about us having opportunity to be right with God, to be given, as Paul said, the right to be children of God. And the world convinces us to go all different directions, to pursue all different kinds of things, to, to find peace and joy and contentment, but the only place that is found in permanence is in our relationship with God. So if you're here today or you're watching and you've never asked Jesus to be a part of your life, we would invite you to do that today. In just a minute, we're going to sing, and as we sing, if you want to talk about that, I'll be in the Welcome Center. You can come and talk to me. Online, you can text or email us. We'll respond to you that way. Maybe you have questions about faith, questions about the Scripture, things that are confusing to you. Please come ask. Don't be afraid to ask your questions. I promise you will not be judged in a negative way by your questions. Maybe today you're going through a really hard time. I want to invite you to run to the one who can. The one who can do more than you ever imagined. So today, as you're being led, as you fill in your spirit what you're supposed to do, we invite you to respond in the way God is leading as we stand together in worship.
Murray Hill, thank you for joining us this Resurrection Sunday. Go and have a wonderful week and live wearing the name of our Savior.